has to be conceived not in terms of multiplication of what goes on within the divine being, but multiplication of what goes on in the objects of the divine will. And that, of course, fits in with the Aristotelian idea that we find, for example, Descartes accepting that when being A acts on being B, on being B, both the action and the passion, that is the action and the being acted on, are located in B, in the patient, and not in the agent. So, and that's important to medieval theologians, for example, Thomas Aquinas, in various ways for preserving his conception of the divine simplicity. So I take it that when Malbranche talks about God multiplying volitions, it's, the question has got to be understood in terms of does the divine, the single divine act of volition have more or fewer intentional objects? And it will have fewer if the volitions are all universal and, and these uh, are all general and these general volitions cover a multitude of particular cases, each one of them. Now, once you see that that's what the issue is, you might think, indeed I do think, well, I suppose that one of those is decisively more worthy of the divine greatness than the other. Okay, but Malbranche, I, mean, I don't see how to understand Malbranche's repeated insistence on this principle otherwise than as a view that it does matter to God's mode of action being worthy of God's perfection, uh, that God's one act of volition have this structure rather than the other. Does that help answer your question? So the logical problems that you raise for the definition in terms of necessary connection, um, they pretty much parallel or they're a version of, of this of these problems are faced by the so-called sufficiency analysis of causal connection presented by proponents of Humean supervenience. So the nece necessary condition analysis faces problems of how do you account for a case of preemption and so on. Sufficient condition analysis of causation faces problems that it just becomes really easy to hook together a sufficient condition which we intuitively do not want to say is a cause, right, mm -hmm. by various. So the solution, uh, well, the 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 situation is desperate for the human supervenient person because they can't do what Malebranche clearly does here, uh, what Steve proposes, which is add, an, add to the purely conceptual notion of necessary connection, this notion of power and the exercise of power. So then a true cause becomes something like that between which and its effect the mind perceives as a necessary productive connection or something like that. Um, so a couple of questions about that then. Uh, one is one might wonder whether you could still hook together things that look like there don't want to be causes. So take the myriological sum of God and the angel, and there's a necessary productive connection between that and its effect, but you'd still the angel, you don't want to say, is part of the true cause. That would be one worry. The other worry is just this, though. Um, so Matterbranch admits that we don't have a clear idea of the production part of it. We have a clear idea, presumably, of the conceptual connection part of it. Uh, but one wonders then if the production part of it is so essential to it, we don't have a clear idea of that, and there can be something analogous to power in created things. Um, it's just a power that doesn't have a necessary connection to its effect. Why not just say, as some causal realists do nowadays, like David Armstrong, well, it's, it is a true cause. It's just a defeasible true cause. Mm -hmm. And then the occasionalist doctrine seems to lose a lot of its force. You can still say, okay, by true cause, I mean, only mean this kind of power, the one that there necessarily produces its effect, but that yeah. other kind of power, I'm going to call that a true cause too, or, you know, yeah. cause too. Um, uh, I think, in the end, all of those are very pertinent uh, questions. I think one upshot 
of the investigation I've been uh, trying to conduct into the, the Malbranche's causal concepts is that while Malbranche has been pretty painstaking, uh, though not always as careful or precise as he should have been, uh, in articulating uh, his conceptions of cause, uh, he's worked hard on that, uh, on the notion of causal connection. And in that, uh, I should say, uh, to a consider to some extent, I mean, he certainly distinguished himself from Descartes, for example. Uh, but uh, he's worked much less hard. In fact, I, I think there's, I, I don't see a comparable development about ideas of power. Uh, and in particular, uh, about the ideas of power that in, are involved in his notion of divine, notions of divine and human freedom. Uh, those notions are not explained, as I point out, they're not explained by his account of true cause. They're not explained by his account of occasional cause. They, uh, one might think they invite at least some further explanation, which he doesn't offer, and it's not obvious uh, that he's prepared to offer it, he might indeed, I think he probably would have to say that uh, we don't have, he certainly will have to say we don't have any clear idea of them because uh, it's one of his doctrines, uh, famously, that we don't have any clear idea of our own minds, uh, we only have a consciousness of them. Uh, and uh, God has a clear idea of our own minds, but God doesn't, unlike God's ideas of extension, which God does show to us, God doesn't show us his clear idea of our minds because for uh, God judges that for purposes of our life, we don't need that clear idea because our conscious, our uh, unclear consciousness of our own minds and our own existence is enough for us. But that means that uh, Malbrush has got to say we don't have uh, a clear conception of the kind of power that our will, that he uh, says our will has, we presumably then don't have a kind of a clear conception of the corresponding power of God's, uh, of God's will, not the, the omnipotence of it uh, to be efficacious, but rather the, the power to uh, make a decision that God was not determined by anything to make. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's an awful lot of uh, work there left to be done, and it's not obvious how Malbranche would set about to do it. I'll add, there's yet another package of broadly causal concepts in here. Uh, you know, I quoted things about, uh, connected with free will, about uh, inclinations that God gives us. Uh, clearly, th there's some idea of a tendency here. Um, and in detailed development of Malbranche's uh, conceptions of free will and sin and so forth, it's explicit that uh, Malbranche thinks that by making uh, uh, virtuous or anti-sinful decisions, uh, that will have, that will be an occasional cause of our finding it easier in the future to make virtuous decisions, and whereas uh, our making a sinful decisions will be an occasional cause of our finding it harder in the future uh, to uh, make uh, virtuous decisions, and that suggests that he's committed to some idea of uh, states of affairs influencing but not completely determining other states of affairs. No explanation whatever of uh, how to articulate that conception. So th there's, there's a lot in there on the power and uh, inclination tendency side of things that uh, goes beneath the radar because I think Malbrush himself never really focused on this, never really uh, said to himself, hey, uh, I'm assuming some pretty important broadly causal concepts here and how do I understand them? We, we don't get a theory of those. I don't know, did I address your question? Thank you. Um, I may be um, sort of raising questions that you've already talked about 
in connection with Des, in connection with um, Steve, but there seems to be, well, let me put it in a very crude way. Um, okay. That's often very helpful. <laughs> well, I hope it will be helpful and not just repetitive, but but because um, I'm still not seeing um, uh, something in Malbranche. Um, um, I think it's very helpful to point out the, the difference between uh, or the moment at which um, 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 Malbranche passes from the necessary connection argument to the continual recreation argument. And that seems to be a very fundamental moment. Um, now, the, the idea uh, or, or the conception of free will in the recherche is, of course, um, um, uh, formulated at a moment when he holds the necessary connection um, 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 argument for occasionalism. But when you, and, and that involves this thing that you were talking about a moment ago, the, the, this uh, power to determine the different way, in different ways, the inclination or impression that God has given to the, to the will. Um, and what I'm wondering is, once he moves to the, moves away from the necessary connection account, to the um, 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 continual recreation account, is there any hope whatsoever of making sense of any sort of power or inclination in the mind? And if you can do that it's in the mind, it seems to me you can do that in the body as well. Okay. Uh, let me address this, and I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it by trying to summarize some of the things that I didn't uh, get time to read because that's, your question is squarely on that. Um, the, uh, first of all, um, the, The inclinations that Malbranche talks about, the tendencies, insofar as they extend over time, in his view, Malbranche's view, rest entirely on the efficacy of the divine will, not of ours. This is the fundamental point, actually, in, in my mind. Uh, what Malbranche ascribes to our wills as a power is a power to make a decision. It's not a power to make a decision by doing something else. Thus, for example, it's not a power to make a decision at T by doing something else before T. It's a power to make a decision. That's all. Uh, it's, uh, and that's that's the is, point of it being an elicited. Earlier. No, this is. But the, this is in the later one, too. I, I, well, Early and late, I think this is the, the point is, early and late, it's an elicited act of the will. And therefore, uh, the power has to exist at the same time as the act. And as far as I can see, um, if God can create, well, let's put it this way. Uh, in the course of arguing, of, of developing the continuous creation argument, Malbranche in a number of places uh, argues, and I'm quoting here, but this is a sample of many places where he says roughly the same thing. And he's talking about bodies. And actually, the continuous creation argument, and I think it's no accident, is almost always developed with bodies as the example. Um, he says, uh, first statement, it's a contradiction that a body be neither at rest nor in motion, and he infers from that, thus it would be a contradiction were God to create a body which he creates neither at rest nor in motion. And I think 
the validity of that inference deserves to be questioned and the 